Um, nice to be on the stage somewhere near Albert Goller after having worked seven years with him together. And I feel a little bit like the master's apprentice. Um, if somebody starts playing Fantasia, then we can all leave the room. Um, not to make light of an important topic, um, I would like to thank very much uh, CETA for providing the, the opportunity to speak on, on this critical topic. Um, Siemens, as Europe's largest uh, engineering house, um, really does believe that Australia uh, should and can have a successful future in manufacturing, um, but we are actually at a critical crossroads. To some extent, um, we have a clean slate. And uh, I'll make some comments in a moment about the auto industry and maybe what that might look like and maybe the forced change to our approach to our part in the global supply chain in automotive um, could be in the future um, be considered a, a blessing in disguise. So I will share with you some thoughts uh, on the topic of Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is a journey that's already started. Um, it's not something that will be a discrete uh, switch in the way manufacturing is done. Something started and it's something that will move for a period of up to 20 years. So what is uh, Industry 4.0? It's what the German government commissioned, uh, it's, it's the reference vision, that the government is basing their industry strategy. It's not a Siemens terminology, it's the German government's terminology. Put sim simply, Industry 4.0 is a term to describe the fourth industrial revolution. You can see in the, in the um, diagram there, the first was mechanics and steam, second mass production lines, third electronics and automation, and the fourth is the picture of the future. It doesn't exist in its uh, complete form yet. Uh, it is in other places in the world called, called advanced manufacturing, the Europeans call it industry 4.0. It's the cyber physical world where we'll see the merging of virtual and physical manufacturing, where products will communicate with production lines as they flow through. Where production processes will be distributed, independent and self-optimising, and we will see personalised mass production. That enables intense globalisation, and it also puts tremendous additional competition for our local offerings, both in our local markets and for the world. So what does it actually look like? We use an analogy um, about BMW. Uh, if you cast your mind back to 1985, and for those of us who were Essendon supporters, you might realise that was the year we beat trounced Hawthorne. Yeah. Don't recall what I was driving at the time, maybe a Chimera, I think, of my mother. Um, but if you, if you were looking to buy a BMW at the time, there were three model series, and about uh, 20 models. And you had a choice of a couple of options. If you come forward to today, uh, I'm not selling BMWs. Uh, if you go forward today on the BMW website, you'll find a funny expression called a configurator. Uh, and you'll find 12 model series, 100 individual models, and an endless ar array of options. So say, OK, is this personalised mass production that I was talking about earlier? And the answer is no. This is just, just, just the tip of the iceberg. In a cyber physical world, when we talk about Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, what you could be able to do, and I'm not saying that this is BMW's uh, strategy, but we supply them with a lot of product lifecycle technologies, you enter the website, uh, their 3D modelling software, you'll set the engineering parameters, which are pre-configured for all the necessary safety features, pre-engineered. With the click of the mouse, you could flare the guards, you could put a bonnet bulge for a more aggressive look, or you could paint the car in acid and colours. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, the integration of the virtual and real world will allow these processes in real-time adjustment. So the manufacturing lines are not able, only producing one-offs, they're able to completely modify as each unit of production goes through the line. Quite, quite a different world, and not the manufacturing facilities that we see at Broadmeadows or in Geelong. Um, these are all actually technically possible at the moment. What we miss globally is actually the platforms, the communication platforms that make uh, that communication possible, but that's coming. With this in mind, the whole concept of shared production emerges. Production lines become a shared service. 
where engineers are actually using the available time on production lines to produce their individual cars. And now back to my comment about should we be lamenting the end of the automotive industry as we knew it, or should we actually be thinking about what does that shared production line look like? Uh, Julie and I were discussing, uh, before I walked up on the stage, about a uh, comment Clive Palmer passed recently. He said, well, Australia anyway produced 400,000 cars, and that's the critical mass of, uh, currently the critical mass uh, you need to be competitive, considered. It's been some time since we produced 400,000 cars in Australia, but at least it was done in four different manufacturing plants in Australia. At that time, we could have had a critical mass if we didn't have the artificial boundaries, a legal entities and manufacturers, but at least that critical mass did exist. And we need to be looking for those opportunities more and more and more in the new, in the new uh, fourth industrial revolution. Industry 4.0 showing um, the minimum prerequisites for maintaining competitiveness. It's about helping businesses become more nimble, adaptable and intelligent from design to prototype to production and throughout the entire life cycle with rapid innovation cycles. So industries can perform faster, better and produce more with fewer resources. However, Industry 4.0 won't suddenly appear as a single piece of software. What's happening at the moment is the equipping equipping of all the manufacturing plants, the detectors, the sensors, they're all going in to collect more and more data that makes this all possible. It's not too late, it's starting, but the direction's absolutely unmistakable. And we need, I think, to get on board with a vision to what that will look like ultimately before most of us uh, retire. As an example, the uh, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter what does it mean? What, is it, what are the challenges of modern manufacturing? It's a true global supply chain. Uh, and the collaboration across the globe is unprecedented. The challenge is unprecedented. The aircraft is manufactured by Lockheed Martin, a coalition of military aircraft manufacturers and suppliers from around the world who must work as one virtual team. Three primary partners, 600 suppliers, production uh, facilities across 30 countries spanning 17 time zones. This is not an enclosed manufacturing environment that we would see at Broadmeadows. It looks quite different. And if we wanted to participate in that industry, we would be doing an element of that global virtual manufacturing. In this particular case, without doing a plug, that's enabled in, in this uh, particular example by a product life, life cycle software, software where engineers worldwide use that same tool uh, and modify their parts and actually the interrelated uh, characteristics of software enable uh, any necessary re-engineering as, as the aircraft develops. So the example is reflective of what large global manufacturing is starting to look like. And as I said pre previously, Australia needs to find its place in the global supply chain. Thoughts that we can be the entire vertical industry supplier for mining, I think are naive in that context. We will have to find a place in industries in the world where we will have a niche. Industry 4.0 will also see the internet of things and services. We're all familiar with the internet. This is a, a slide actually that I, I took from some colleagues at Bosch. It's a German based slide. Um, but it's talking about uh, the internet of people. We all communicate with each other. But now uh, intelligence is being be built into all sorts of products, devices and services. The world of Industry 4.0 will be incredibly smart and networked. This transformation is leading to the emergence of smart grids in the field of energy supply and smart logistics and smart health. This completely changes the manufacturing environment. Devices talking to each other, productions running down the production line, telling the machine what colour I need to be, rather than the machine just painting onto a dumb product. Fascinating. Industry 4.0 will also see the convergence of all stages of the production process. It's from a linear discrete to one merged integrated unit in production. If I go forward, I'll just, in the interest of time, I'll slip forward two slides. Siemens has invested about $4 billion, keep going please, that one, on different software enterprises over the last five years, simply to keep abreast with the need uh, to provide elements to the integrated future world of 4.0. Our own production facilities uh, 
that produce our automation controllers in Germany. The factory now um, is operating at a 12 per million error rate, 99.9988, by the standardisation, by the automation, by the actual interactive uh, mechanisms that are happening on that production line. I'm not sure where that slide comes from. Keep, keep going forward. <laughs> but if we talk about now what's, what's needed, um, I'm talking a lot about software. I'm talking a lot about IT. And certainly from an Siemens point of view, those skills are in, in short supply in the sorts of level that we're talking about to, to take us to the future. Success in the new environment will require new and higher level of skills, particularly science, technology, engineering and mathematics, STEM skills. If we look a bit deeper and I compare Australia to Germany, we only have, for example, very few uh, types of electrical engineers. By necessity, we are generalists, whereas in Germany there are seven main electrical engineering degrees. Universities running different flavours and specialities of those degrees. Students can choose 220 very specialised engineering titles just in electrical engineering. And I, in a presentation I gave recently to CETA, I, I uh, used a, a phrase from uh, Kutcher Partners. They said that uh, economy is demography. And I was bold, so bold as to say maybe Australia is not going to be a first world sized economy. We have to find our place as a second tier sized economy in the global supply chains. One of the consequences, of course, is big data. Um, 2003, it would have taken you a thousand years to produce five billion gigabits of data. In 2013, the same volume of data is generated in 10 minutes. Modern production facilities are generating more and more data. Gathering, storing data is the least of the problem, actually, now. The real challenge is turning that, the bits and bytes into meaningful information. The interpretation and the doing something with the data that's collected. Six trillion gigabytes of inf information will be produced in production facilities this year. That's a six with 21 zeros on the back. For the uninitiated amongst us, uh, the term is zettabytes. The volume in weeks is expected to double every year. And it's doubling in, in, every year because this direction, this data capture direction in production, I'm not talking about a, a Microsoft uh, laptop. I'm talking about production software. So if you want to be competitive in the future, you need to be able to A, handle big data, but B, interpret it. And you need the IT tools to be able to do that. Um, Germany, for example, has um, um, established a number of, uh, of working units to facilitate this transition. Go to Europe, there is a strong fo focus on small, medium enterprises. The Germans called it their Mittelstand. These organisations that are not top tier, they're in the middle, but they provide the economic substance in Germany. They provide the wealth of Germany en masse. The European Union's Factories of the Future program is intended to change that back with a funding of 1.2 billion euros. Not 100 million for um, Mr McFarlane's announcement today. Is that the right number, Julie? 100 million? 150 million? Yet, but we'll, we'll see how much is in the 1.2 billion at an EU level to influence the direction of industry. Some 80 projects are already underway, many of which are involved digitalisation of production. They're only part of the massive uh, Horizon 2020 program, uh, which is the most expensive research and in innovation promotion project ever funded by the EU. It will run from 2014 to 2020 and then we'll spend a total budget of 70 billion euros. 17 of that has been set aside for the innovation and manufacturing, including the de developing uh, information and communication technologies, new materials, nanotechnologies, advanced production systems, factories of the future and other technologies. In India, the stated goal is to shift the proportion of GDP from 16% to 25% uh, by 2025. In the US, they're building the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation, 15 research institutions across the nation. And in the UK, they've set up the Catapult Centres, a network of leading technology and innovation centres. So what can our government do? 
Um, I think we've said it before, it's about articulating a clear intention to have elements in manufacturing. I'm pleased to hear that we've stated at least some areas of, of focus now. Um, the Minister McFarlane has came out and made that statement. The question is how is that going to be supported? I was interested to hear uh, uh, Prime Minister Abbott's comments on uh, a government's role is to do what the people can't do and not more. I think that's right in, in principle, but in today's world there is much more guidance required and direction required from the central government to make sure that limited resources are not, not spread too, too broadly. Skip forward for the interest of time. If you're an infrastructure government, and we all agree that infrastructure is in need of expansion in Australia, you must make the opportunity, take the opportunity to make sure that when you build infrastructure that you actually require new skills to be used in that infrastructure. So if I talk about and, and try to connect that to Industry 4.0, laying bitumen by itself won't develop the sorts of skills that the country needs to transition from manufacturing old to manufacturing new to Industry 4.0. What are, the types of, uh, what are the types of projects that actually enable us to develop skills, to transition skills from, um, from the monkey wrench to the, to the tablet on the production field? If I look at one of the projects that, that takes our interest is the submarine project, for example. The submariners describe that as the, the snowy hydro scheme of this century. They describe it as a nation building exercise. That particular project, the building of 12, 12 subs, creates a 100-year industry in Australia. It has potential to be fully digitalised. It has the potential to localise large parts of the propulsion, electricals, etc., etc., etc. It's more than just border protection. Much, much more. If, if we get the equation right and if we actually apply the technologies during the construction of things rather than replicate things of old and import things alone. In closing, uh, the analogy that we use often is uh, Formula One. Formula One competition is global, yet it's super, super competitive, and it is technology alone that's the enabler. We are all in a race globally to the industry 4.0. It relies on continual investment in technology. Australian capex in manufacturing capex is at a 25 year low at the moment. There will not be long-term product productivity gains if there is no capex investment in Australia. So the race is on. I think Industry 4.0 isn't an answer. It's a framework, but it's painting the picture of the future, and it's digitalised, and it's coming very fast. Thank you.